Ooh. Ooh. Oh, hello there. Welcome to Brainwaves, episode 41, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. My name is Jamie Adams, and, well, Ian's not here at the moment. I don't know where he's gone. You know, new year, new problems for Ian, I don't know. Um, but I have decided to bring along the newest Brainwaves giant brain intern, Mr. Ian Chantler. Ian, hi, well, come, come have a look. Have a look at this, come in. Hello, this is a very spacious office you've got here. Yeah, it's nice. It's usually a bit, a bit, um, a bit less roomy when Ian's in here, but you know he's, he's, you know he's got things to do. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah. Um, listen, if would you mind if Ian's um, not here? I mean, I'm going to give it, you know, another, I don't know, ten seconds or so. If he's not here, could you possibly like sit in for him? I mean, you know, it, you're also called Ian, so it's hopefully not going to be too difficult. Oh yeah, absolutely. That is easy peasy. Uh, what's going on here? Damn, nine seconds. Hi, Ian. Hello, Ian. I mean, I know he's also called Ian, but that doesn't mean you can just get him to stand in for me. What on earth? Get get, get out of here. Go on, shoot. Goddamn interns. Out. I'm sorry. I'll go back to the basement. Yeah, damn uh, right Ian, you will. Ian, it's dirty Ian, down no, there. Ian, Ian. Uh, Ian, what the heck, man? He asked for a tour of the studio, so I, I brought him in. I don't care. Interns don't get what they want. Mate, I knew you were having problems near Christmas. I remember all the, the rumblings about mistreating interns. This is getting serious. Treat them like human beings, for goodness sake. You have been awfully lackluster recently. Oh, maybe, maybe. Anyway, anyway, did you, uh, you sorted out a guest, right? Uh, I've been asleep under the desk for the last two or three weeks. Are you a squirrel? Did you hibernate? Not going to comment on that. You were the one that usually deals with the guests. I was just sleeping here. Oh, um, look, okay, look. Okay, go, look, go and get him back then. Maybe we'll, we'll have him on, okay, okay. as an apology. Go, go and two, get him back. Two, two seconds, two seconds. Ian, come back in here. Ian, Ian, come on, come on. Look, Ian's not going to hurt you. Come on, Ian. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, Ian, right. Are Ian, you sure? Say, yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Ian, say sorry to Ian. I'm very sorry. Sorry, Ian. Ian, you don't need to say sorry to Ian. It's Ian that needs to say sorry to you, Ian. I am. I am sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. I. I. I, Yeah. Just getting back in the swing of things. Right. Enough of this. Enough of this. Okay. Ian. There's. uh, Yep. There's a microphone. Here's some headphones. And let's do this thing. These are the headlines for the week of twentieth January. Ian. Ian. What? You know. Really enthusiastic. Love your energy. Wonderful. But New Year. Let's see how Ian tries with it. Sure. If that's okay, Ian. Absolutely. It's fine. These are the headlines for the week of 20th of January 2020. Fantasy Flight Games starts the new year with a less than fantasy start. New Dungeons & Dragons book announced and fans are unhappy. And finally, Asmodee gets its mojo back. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. I like that, it was good. A little bit more upbeat, a little more enthusiastic. That's what we really want to see in the studio. Ian, Ian, give the boy a chance. Give him a chance. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, so we are starting our first cast of the year with news of large numbers of layoffs and cancellations from Fantasy Flight Games. It was announced just last week that Fantasy Flight Interactive staff have been laid off. This was the digital arm of Fantasy Flight Games that had put out the Lord of the Rings card game online and hadn't really done anything else over the last couple of years and they have all been laid off. This has also affected the RPG arm of Fantasy Flight Games. A a bunch of the RPG uh, folk have been laid off as well, including the senior producer Tim Huckleberry. FFG have not commented yet on any of the layoffs, but they have confirmed that all four of the previously announced RPG products planned for the next few months, including Genesis Secrets of the Crucible, which is the Keyforge book they're about to release, Legend of Five Rings RPG Sins of Regret, the Path of Waves for that same RPG, a game map for the RPG and Star Wars Age of Rebellion Starships and Speeders will all still be released. And interestingly, that all three product lines are still ongoing. So none of those product lines have been cancelled as yet. Talking of cancellations, just before we came on air, this is the 14th of January, Fancy Flight announced that they were bringing an end to the Star Wars Destiny line. Now this is their card dice game, a collectible, collectible game. It said that the covert mission set, which is upcoming, will be the last 
And uh, this has come as quite a surprise to fans by the looks of it on, on, online, by the looks of the reaction online, um, much like the cancellation of Netrunner came as a surprise to that community. So what do we think this means, guys? Uh, is it just a bit of consolidation? Is it Are we seeing the same sort of thing from Fancy Flight that we saw from Aldrich Entertainment Group, AEG, last year, where they're going to be putting out less games but better quality ones and they're just consolidating their resources to do that or is this signs of bigger trouble for fantasy flight i think it is unlikely that fantasy flight is for example going to maybe stop producing merchandise under the star wars license because the rise of skywalker has just come out and there's a fine seam ready to be mined there and X-Wing is a massive property for them if exactly. they're going to do everything they can to retain that license. Yeah, of course. And that's you know, that's still going, you know, as far as I'm aware, pretty strong. Uh, it might be that just Star Wars Destiny, you know, has run its course. Maybe maybe the the figures were just not there for what you know they would plan to put into it. You know, it's I'm entirely speculating here because that's all I can do. I'm I love my blind speculation, as regular listeners might know. The role-playing game, you know, they've got the three main product lines. Great, you know, they're they're all going well. I mean, RPGs are always going to bring in less money than their board game and card game and miniature, well, now miniature game properties, X-Wing and Star Wars Legion as well. Our hearts go out to those who have lost their jobs and hopefully they'll find safe homes. But that, I mean, that RPGs have always brought in less money, even in this sort of growth period of RPGs where we've seen a lot of... Um, Dungeons and Dragons and that kind of thing come to the fore and, and RPGs are certainly growing but for a company like Fancy Flight it's still got to be sort of a very small percentage of their annual take. The whole thing makes me wonder if Disney are about to do a similar thing to what Games Workshop did with Fancy Flight in that just say okay we'll make more money by just farming this license out to lots of different developers rather than just Fancy Flight. Jamie you're talking about D&D I think there's a new book out and fans are unhappy apparently. Well, yes, there is indeed. I am going to bite back the retort that goes the internet generally is fueled on misery. But there is a new source book announced for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. The new book announced is Explorer's Guide to Wildermount. I hope I've said that correctly. Which is the campaign source book for Critical Role, the phenomenally successful live stream and web series hosted by Matthew Mercer that has brought probably Dungeons & Dragons to most people over the last couple of years. I will admit I've never seen it, but I'm aware of it by cultural osmosis and, you know, hanging around those nerdy areas of the internet. This is apparently going to be, you know, detailing all the information you can uh, of this area of which Critical Role finds itself. And to say there's been a bit of backlash is a slight understatement. There's a lot of fans going, you know, this is great, this is wonderful. It's not what I wanted, though. It's not Spelljammer. It's not Dragonlance. It's not Dark Sun. It's not Planescape. Where are all these books? Where are all these settings? These classic ones that people have known for years. Where's my setting? I don't want it. Yeah, the, the pace of release has been a little slower for D&D. However, there is like things like the DMs Guild, where people are putting out loads of sort of homebrew content and re- some really good stuff in there. Like basically a lots of DLC effectively for Dungeons and Dragons. So there's a lot of content out there. There's lots of things for free or for pay that you can use to enhance your D and D games, and not all of them are being produced by Wizards of the Coast. So you can look elsewhere for your fifth edition content. And I think it's a good thing that they're putting out fewer books that are higher quality. I think that's actually a good thing. I can understand the fans' frustration if you're really into a particular saying, but going on the internet and shouting about it is not going to help. No, but it's the internet, and you know, it's worth a try. And actually, Matthew Mercer himself has commented on on the, the backlash somewhat. And he commented, basically an hour after the official news released, on Reddit, Matt Mercer said was saying, you know, he spent about one and a half years working on the project, He's aware of how much negativity can permeate, you know, the spaces regarding the games, uh, regarding myself and the games we play, and that's okay. One could never expect our form of storytelling and gaming to be everyone's cup of tea. And it could very well be this just isn't the book for you. I don't begrudge you that, and I only hope one day we get a chance to roll some dice at a convention and swap stories about our love of the game. Which is fun, you know, which, which is a very positive message. You know, he also says... You, he he says to the people, you're the people shouting about, I want, you know, Planescape, I want Dark Sun, I want all these things. I'm shouting that as well. Sometimes in Wizards of the Coast's offices, sometimes <laughs> right in their ears. Unfortunately, if 
they're going to have plans. It's not going to change because I shouted at them. As far as I'm aware, a lot of Gorilla does have some, or some homebrewed classes, archetypes, and such and so forth. And Mercer has addressed this, going, some people don't like that. That's fine. You don't have to use it. And as you said, Ian, there is the DMs Guild, which there is a torrent of stuff now. There's a connectivity with Dungeons and Dragons that I, you know, I'll say I don't think that's ever been seen before. You know, able to share so much information and stories, both good and bad. Yeah, some like, some like Mercer's been a positive force for D and D, and the fans should like support that effort because it brings more people into hobby, which means that Wizards of the Coast gets more money, which means they will put out more books. And they happen to have put out this bit because they know Critical Role is has brought a lot of people into the hobby. They know it'll be popular with a large part of their fan of the D and D fan base. Will it be for everyone? No, because that would be a miracle product. No product is for everyone, and mo- the rest of the stuff is probably coming. And it doesn't affect the work that those people are doing on those potential products as well. Putting this book out, it gives them more money to do that. Do you know what? Just. If you don't like it, that's fine. Just, you know, something something will happen. And I'm sadly, it's, it's not going to change because people aren't happy with it. Ian, I believe you've got a news story for us. Um, some wonderful art news, I think. Yes, I do, Jamie. That's right. Yes. Uh, Ian, oh, did Ian, you Ian. That? That's me. Yep. Also, Ian. This is something I'm genuinely quite excited about. The Art of the Tabletop Initiative, which seems basically aimed at getting students and new illustrators and actually focus on illustration in the tabletop industry, which has been lacking for a while. So it's a new initiative being launched in February between the website Mojo Nation and Asmodee UK to encourage graphic design and illustration students to consider careers in the board game industry. The way Asmodee are going to be doing this is they'll be speaking at the participating universities throughout the UK and uh, about the effect of art in the industry, and students will be tasked with creating new card, board, and packaging artwork for several well-known games published under the Asmodee umbrella, which includes Splendor, Mysterium, and Codenames. So these students will be given two months for this task, then they will be judged, and the best artwork will be exhibited at the UK Games Expo 2020. Ben Hogg, the marketing manager for Asmodee UK, has said that the rise in popularity of tabletop games has been widely reported for a number of years, with students and the younger generation a key contributor to this growth. We want to showcase to budding art students the depth and variety of the visual design that goes into the huge number of games released every year. Whilst many students may enjoy playing games, they may be unaware of the sheer size of the tabletop world and the amount of artwork that is created for it. We can't wait to see how the students will reimagine our games. So at first glance, this seems like it might be a kind of spec work thing where they're getting students to do artwork for free. But in actual fact, what they're doing is they're they're not making new games with this art. What they're doing is they're saying, here's our existing games. What would you do with those games? And then the best of those, instead of being offered money or something like that, the best of those will be exhibited at the UK Games Expo. So it seems just basically a straight enter this competition and the winners will be shown off, which I really, really like, actually. Yeah, and especially at something like UK Games Expo, where you're going to get a lot of companies turning up, a lot of like art directors for companies will probably be there, and they'll be able to see new talent coming through, which is a really cool idea. I really like it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. It's a really good idea. It's better than these sort of like competitions you do see occasionally for things, where it's like, do a thing for free for us, and we'll use it in our marketing campaigns. Like, no, <laughs> yeah, those are the worst. I'm I'm slightly intrigued when they said, you know, they'll be creating the artwork for for the games. Are they going to be given, for example, let's take Splendor, you know, uh, the theme of which loosely is gems, gem cutters and gem makers. And is it going to have to specifically relate to that? Or are they going to be given a brief going, this is what the kind of the game you do. This is what this is the game. This is how generally it plays. This is how we've this is, this is how we've, um, you know, this is how we who when we released it, looked at it. But maybe you want to take do something different. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Like, certainly Splendor and Codenames, I can see them basically making new themes for, without too much problem. Mysterium might be a little harder, because that's quite, the art in that is quite tied to its theme. Whereas something like Splendor, I could see it being, like, exchanging, I don't know, cyberpunk parts in the 2077 or something like that. You know, it could be pretty much anything, really. The theme isn't strongly tied to to the art in that particular game so it'll be really interesting to see what they do maybe it'll just be marketing material kind of stuff but, but i mean like it's in 
it's interesting to know. I think art's become a much bigger thing. And when we had the Ross from More Games Please on, we talked about this a little bit. It's become a much larger thing in board games. I was just looking at the Oath Kickstarter like back today, and it's got 300 unique pieces of art from one artist. Yeah. That's, that's quite an undertaking. Incredible. And that doesn't include like board or anything like that. That's just the cards. So, yeah, like there's a need. I think there is a need in the industry for new artists, artists coming up, and they'll want to make their games stand out by getting the best and bright new talent it's very cool yeah i think that focus on art is really important now given the number of games that come out every year because you see so many games come out and the ones that have bad art just don't make a splash whatsoever anyway i think that's enough for the headlines let's move on to the news We're starting the news with a little bit of a shout out to Emma May, the designer of the Quirk card game. She has recently been picked up by Gibsons, which is a much bigger sort of mainstream toy and board game company. Emma's done a lot of great work getting her game into places like Waterstones, into really mainstream stores. And for such a, such a small publisher, she's done really well at getting her game out there. And it's great to see that effort being rewarded by being picked up by a large company like Gibsons, which can only hope to bring her game to a wider audience. So congratulations, Emma. AEG are announced a new pre-order program, Ian. Yes, they have. So this speaks to allocation problems in the industry in general. It's a new priority pre-order program, P3. It's aimed at easing allocation problems for retailers, and retailers can register interest in product on a Google form. This interest is then passed to their distributor, and they get priority allocation for those products. So it starts with Mariposas, the new game from Wingspan designer Elizabeth Hargrave. As I'm sure we all know, Wingspan got slammed a bit for distribution issues, which there was a lot of discussion about at the time. Having learned a little bit about the distribution of board games, it is mostly not great. I've been in retail for a very long time, and most people don't really understand how the stuff that's on your shelves gets on those shelves. We just don't really understand it. And it, I think it'd be an interesting thing to get maybe a couple of guests on some point sometime this year to sort of give us the lowdown on how board game distribution works because there's there's always problems with board game supply, especially with new games, with new big popular games because it's so hard to predict demand. And some distributors don't want to carry new games, but then they prove popular. But then by the time they go back to the publisher, they're out of the game and then they have to wait for the print run and blah, 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 so on and so forth. It's It's a really interesting problem. Because you have to print in such large numbers and you have to sort of guess how much you're going to sell. Uh, it sounds like there's issues even with the largest distribution networks. As I was speaking to the Lucky Sparrow bunch at Glasgow Games Festival back in November, and they were mentioning a specific distribution network that they have. And the system in, through which they order board games sounds chaotic and disorganized i know exactly what you're talking about and yes it's totally insane <laughs> it's a very straight it's a very strange system so yeah it'll be interesting to see what ag does with this especially interesting because ag is one of the publishers that said last year they're going to be producing less game so maybe this is an attempt to sort of bolster those games that they are going to be putting out they said they're only going to be putting out like maybe four or five titles in a year some expansions but mainly just four or five titles so i think this this is probably a reaction to that as well trying to bolster the availability of those titles when they do put them out to make sure they're actually in in retailers and talking about new games jamie fantasy flight have actually announced something good that makes it sound as if you're saying that a lot of what fantasy flight produces is not good ian um i'm gonna take that under advisement well more 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 that the news that they have been putting out the news around them recently has not uh-huh, been good uh-huh, uh-huh this is a new i like i like fancy flies products but yeah their news recently has not been no great. it hasn't this is a new game but it is also in some ways part of an old game because there has been an announcement over the last few days of cosmic encounter duel now cosmic encounter is a grandee of the board game hobby i don't think it's a hyperbole to say that yes it doesn't have the history of say chess or or go or even snap but, you know, it's now 43 years old. I mean, that is a serious length of time for a game. And it's a game that's still getting a lot of play and still expansions getting released to this day. But they've just announced, and they, I mean Fantasy Flight, of course, have just announced a two-player standalone version uh, set in the universe, of course. And the core box, which is the only one that's been announced so far, will come with 27 new races. Now, I have only played, straight away, I've only played Cosmic Encounter once, and that was about four years ago. 
I kind of enjoyed it. Um, I've not really been in a situation where someone has had it and has been up for playing it since. I enjoyed it, but I still had that slight feeling that I think has put me off several other games, uh, whereby I think it was it was about a six-player game, and I think it was myself and one other person didn't know how to play the game, and four others did. And they were quite good at it, but they weren't so good as they kind of went a little bit easy on the newer ones. It was a bit of kind of throwing headlong in and going, you'll understand it, you'll like it, trust me. I thought it was all right. How it'll work as a two-player is my biggest quandary at this point. I think it's an interesting thing for Fancy Flight to do because one of the things you see a lot of, especially on Kickstarter, is people asking like how a game works two-player or how a game works solo. That's quite often like early requests on any Kickstarter. So I think it's interesting for Fancy Flight because they've still got Cosmic Encounter. They're still producing that game. And then for them to do a dual version will respond to that demand from fans to like have us or maybe a quicker two-player version of a game they really like in a similar theme. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see them produce like a, a smaller box kind of thing like that. And maybe we'll see more of that kind of thing from, from them over the course of the year. I'm genuinely quite interested to see the design of this as things like Seven Wonders transforming into the two-player version worked, in my mind, really, really well. Whereas I'm not that much of a fan of the full seven-player game, but I'm quite impressed by the dynamics in the two-player game. So I'm not a fan of Cosmic Encounter, but there are plenty of really great, really snappy two-player games, and if they manage to take some of those designs into Cosmic, then it could could work really well. I was going to say, it would be quite easy just to sneer and go, oh, but Cosmic Encounter is a game all about negotiation and, you know, diplomacy, so how's that going to work with two-player? And you go, well, you're just going to have to find out, won't you? Anyway, if we're going to be like inducting this new intern here into how things work, I think I think we should like get him involved in a brainstorm, maybe get him in through through in the other studio. Sure, I thought right. my main okay. job was just getting coffee and surviving the basement. Oh, Ian, not anymore. You are joining the big leagues, my friend. Oh dear. Right this way to the brainwaves discussion table. Brainwaves. I thought we'd have a sort of. A slightly prognostic kind of brainstorm in this episode. There's a lot of speculation going on right now about what 2020 is going to bring to the hobby. A lot of uh, different uh, media types putting out their sort of predictions for the year. So I thought we'd have a little shot at this ourselves. What are your predictions, uh, gents, for 2020 in the hobby? It could be games. It could be industry stuff. What, what do you What do you think? What's your sort of top prediction for 2020? Uh, My first one is to find out what prognostic means. Give me two seconds. Ian, why don't you have a talk? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Sure thing. One thing I reckon is going to be a big thing this year is actually re-releases, updates and reimaginings. So taking a cue from the film industry where you see endless rehashes of the same film over and over, I think we're going to see a lot more of board games taking classics and updating them or just plain out re-releasing them so we've already mentioned sidereal confluence um and slightly cosmic encounter but there's also so this year my favorite game comet what has had an update to the rules called comet 1.5 and this coming year there's going to be a new comet called blood on the sand which sounds essentially like a re-release plus a slight change there's not been that much details about it but i think this is my prediction, this is my wild speculation for this year, is that board game companies are going to look at their old catalogues and say, actually, we've got a series of hidden gems here, but a lot of them have incredibly outdated art and incredibly outdated graphic design, even if they're only five or six years old. And I think they're going to update that graphic design to modern standards, put in new art, and then they can sell it without any extra development work being necessary. I think that's a really interesting point. I, we've had restoration games, obviously, going back to older games and, and re-releasing them. They've got Return to the Dark Tower on Kickstarter right now, for instance. As Hobby's grown and as we've got so many more games coming out, I think we are replicating what, like you mentioned, the sort of film industry where big companies play it safe a little bit, a bit, a little bit more with properties they know will sell. So going back into their back catalogue for games they know have sold in the past and yeah, giving them a fresh look of paint retheme whatever and just re-releasing those seems like a good safe way to make money i mean the ball has been started rolling slightly with games such as love letter from zedman games i have a copy of the original kind of red bag love letter when it was 
AEG was dealing with it, and it was in the Tempest series of games, I believe. Uh, and the art was related to that. And, you know, the art was absolutely fine. It was quite white. Quite white. And now, with Zedman getting it, um, there's been a new version that's been re- uh, released last year, which puts the player count up to six, has changed the art, diversifies it nicely. And, yeah, you know, I think it's still a very good game. I've, I've got both copies now, and I'm very happy that I've got them. What about you, Jamie? What do you think? What's your sort of top prediction for 2020? Looking at probably the last year or so, and just seeing a trend. Now, you know, again, entirely speculation, but the tail end of last year, sorry, the tail end of 2018 into 2019, saw Later Games' root take off in a spectacular way. And I know that uh, Ian and you, Ian, uh, do really enjoy Root and are looking forward to the Underworld expansion coming out very soon. I cannot wait moles. to play with those moles. Those moles and those ravens or crows, oh, they look great. I cannot wait. And on the new maps as well. What's your point here, Jamie? Um, there is a point. Let me get to it very quickly. Well, we had Root and then last year we had the re-release and re-artwork, the rebirth, if you will, of Dune you know, the seminal, asymmetric, area control, backstab game, which Ian and I played. I think I may have mentioned it on the cast. I can't remember, but we played just before Christmas. Um, We got three turns into a 10-turn game. It took us about two and a half hours, and I flippin' loved it. But yeah, I think, I think 2020, we are going to be seeing uh, a slight upsurge in asymmetric games. I think that having variable player powers and not just, oh yeah, we've got the same game, but also not really, Uh, you know, starting with things like Root or Dune where it is, the mechanics are the same sort of, but every faction plays differently all the way up to, you know, I'm mentioning later games because they've done some quite nice asymmetric games like Vast. I guess it gives a game more longevity as well. It gives it more re- replayability. It's a, it's an easy way to add that factor into... Well, not an easy way to add a fa- that into a game, but it's a way to add that replayability factor into a game. And certainly if we're, if we're seeing... Well, come to my prediction, which is like basically I think we'll see a lot more consolidation in the industry, and I think we'll see people putting out fewer games. And I think in general we'll see customers being a little bit more picky with their money as well. Because there's so much choice out there, they'll be a little bit more picky with what they buy. So they'll be looking for added factors into those games. So yeah, they'll be looking for, uh, to speak to both of your points, like games that look really good and games that have got that replayability factor factor in them and that sort of like that longevity in there are maybe a little bit more of an evergreen title that the company will continue to support for the length of that, that game's run. Do you think, just to follow on from that, but people are going to get slightly more picky, you know, as... Uh, social situations change as the political climate change just as two examples which will have effects that we can't even think of right now and people as you said people are going to be looking to be a bit more uh not conservative but more picky of what they spend their their money on uh, game wise do you think that's going to put extra i guess pressure extra emphasis on the critical side of the industry and people might have to start getting a bit more picky about the quality of criticism, the quality of journalism. I hope so. I think that'd be a very good thing. Uh, I don't think. I think there are some great critics out there. I think they are also not the most popular channels for sort of board game reviews and previews and that kind of thing. Like I really like people like Dan Thorot, um, Owen Duffy, any a lot of the people that are involved in There Will Be Games, like Matt Thrower, Dan Jolin. There's a lot of really good critics out there who write really good stuff, but. They seem to be a small. They're quite a small part of the critical. What's the word I'm looking for? Critical machinery of the hobby, and I think crit, that good criticism is needed to help guide people to like the games that are good and not away from the games that maybe aren't so good, or just just to tie into a particular critics' tastes. And I've written about this recently, in like just towards the end of last year, about like the sort of critical faculties that we have as as a hobby. I'll, I'll link to that article in the show notes. But yeah, I, th- I think we will see more of that. I think we will see a desire to get better criticism into the hobby. I think the Oath Kickstarter we've seen today has been a really good example of that, as it's it's definitely a complex idea to get your head around. And the main review that seems to be shared is not some kind of Kickstarter paid preview, but it's Dan Thurot's, um overview of it, 
um, which includes some really strong terms like that it's a hate letter to civilization games, that kind of thing. And his analysis is really crisp and really in depth and great, and quite quite academic at the same time. Yeah, I th- I thought that was interesting as well. I don't think I've seen a couple of other people who've got preview copies now. The the sort of review stuff's coming out later, but yeah, that was the one review that they obviously wanted. Yep, absolutely. And that's re- that's really interesting because he's a, such a good writer and it's, and he's very analytical about games. Yeah, and it's quite different to like getting like a paid like a paid video preview from one of the bigger sites or whatever. So, uh, any any other predictions for twenty twenty, gents? As a very small prediction, I think that trick taking games are going to be a little more into this year. The designer I follow on Twitter, Daniel Newman, is chatting a lot about making trick taking games a bit more interesting, and people seem to be really into it. So, yeah, tiny prediction, but I think yeah, there'll be a bunch this year, and I think they'll be good. There's one game I've been hearing about called, uh, I think it's Die K- Die Crew. It's a German game, like it's a cooperative trick taking game, which is apparently making some waves. So yeah, maybe grand. I like a good, I like a good trick taking game. Anyway, that's our predictions for 2020, folks. Uh, do get in touch with what you think you're going to be seeing in 2020. Uh, you can email us, get in touch on social media, or well, I don't know, send us a homing pigeon. Let's get out of here. Yeah, back back to the warm, comfy uh, chairs. Do I need to go back to the basement? No, uh, the basement days are far behind you now. Excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. The lawyers have been in touch and said I was too mean to you earlier, so I now have to give you like a proper job. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Stupid lawyers. <laughs> God damn it. Well, it is 2020, a brand new year, but we couldn't leave the first podcast of the year without some good old news about that perennial favourite, Monopoly. Oh yes, oh yes, 2020, and already we've got Monopoly news. This is actually coming from just the tail end of last year, so it's slightly cheating, but be quiet. Um, This is actually a team-based Monopoly game, which I, you know... I can't think of a team-based Monopoly game that's been released by Hasbro recently, but I have done a lot of these Monopolies now, and they tend to all blur into one eventually. This Monopoly game is Monopoly Llamas vs. Unicorns, with the a- the aim of the game, apparently, is uh, settling the, to quote the product description, the lively rivalry between the said South American mammals and fictional horses with horns. So instead of properties on the board, teams will be trying to collect titles such as Sweetest, Most Colourful, and Twinkliest Eyes. You've got the twinkliest eyes, Jamie. Oh, you say the kindest things. Uh, The game will end when all the properties are bought, uh, and the team with the most titles will win. Now this plays from one to six players, and will come with three unicorn pieces and three llama pieces. Now, before anyone gets snippy, please remember this is a game for people aged eight and above. So it might not exactly be your demographic, and that's okay. It's definitely not my demographic, but that's fine. I do question, though, the lively rivalry between between llamas and unicorns. Can't say I've ever heard of it before right now. (laughs) Me neither, I'm afraid. Okay, whatever, guys. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, are you aware of, like online llama unicorn wrestling matches or something oh nobody said wrestling matches not yet anyway the game is not available in the uk as of right now but it is possible that it'll be released very soon i would say that we'll keep you informed if it does reach our shores i've got no idea when it's going to show up maybe the new critical journalism will take a deep dive into the rivalry between llamas (laughs) and unicorns (laughs) Yes. We'll get to the heart of the matter. <laughs> that, that's my other prediction. We're going to see more Llama vs. Unicorn games uh, this year. It's going to be an asymmetric area control war game. Uh, <laughs> Llamas v. Unicorns. Yeah, 5,000 chits. Takes 24 hours. Can't wait. Oh, awesome. Anyway, before we go, we'd just like to give a shout out to our patrons, uh, especially to our newest patron, Hal Duncan, who's pledged at the team member level. Welcome to the team, Hal, and thank you very much for joining our patron. 
And of course, to our executive producers, the Lucky Sparrow Gaming Cafe, an excellent gaming cafe in Glasgow. And if you would like to join our patron, we'll put a little link in the show notes for just $1 a month that you will get access to all our extras. So that's basically extended versions of this cast and the occasional Idle Thoughts podcast that we put out, which is basically uh, the team talking about the games they've been playing recently. Ian, why don't you do the outro a little bit? Show us what you're made of. Very well. So if you just read... And do I get fired if I'm not lively enough? I'm not allowed to, apparently. Excellent. I'll I'll read this in a very droll, dead voice. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's just what I want. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. If you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast and drop us a review and rating on iTunes. You can also follow us. Join us on Twitter at, at the Giant Brain, Instagram, Giant Brain UK, Facebook the giant brain website giantbrain.co.uk and email giantbrainuk at gmail.com well i guess that was okay what did you think jamie i think you could probably take your job probably take my job come to think of it well that might just happen you better be careful now anyway say goodbye ian goodbye ian say goodbye ian goodbye ian goodbye everyone take care <laughs>